If you've got an itchy nose, you'll probably want to scratch it. And in order to scratch your nose, there has to be coordinated muscle contraction to lift your arm, to bend your wrist, to extend your finger, to scratch your nose. All of those things require coordinated muscular contraction. And muscles will only contract if they're stimulated by an electrical impulse or physiologically by a nervous impulse. And a nervous impulse, of course, is electrical in nature. So where does this impulse begin to cause the muscles in my hand and arm and fingers to contract in order to scratch my nose? Well, the impulse actually begins in the motor cortex in the brain. And as you might remember, the motor cortex is located in the frontal lobe of the brain in an area called the precentral gyrus. And once the cells in that motor cortex have generated a new nerve impulse that will pass through the brain, down the spinal cord, out of the appropriate spinal nerves to contract the appropriate muscles. Now, the reason the appropriate cells in the motor cortex depolarize to generate a new nerve impulse is because you will that to happen. Now, how that happens, we don't know. No one knows why the mere act of me willing to move a muscle causes the appropriate controlling motor neurons in my motor cortex to spontaneously depolarize and generate a new nerve impulse. And yet that is exactly what they do. So the nerve impulse begins in the motor cortex. The electrical activity begins in the brain as a result of my will. But with the heart, the situation is different. The heart will contract spontaneously on its own. So you might have heard gruesome stories about human sacrifice where the heart is taken out of the chest, still beating. That is an actual fact, what could happen. Or in more enlightened times, we have many patients who have had heart transplants. They have received a donor's heart. Now, if you think about it, when that heart is taken out from the donor's body, by definition, all of the nerve connections to that heart are going to be severed and the heart will be implanted into the recipient without any neuronal connections. And yet the heart can keep beating for many years or hopefully decades without being connected to the nervous system of the recipient. So why is it that the cardiac muscle is different from the voluntary muscles in that it doesn't need external neuronal stimulation in order to contract? Well, actually, if you have a group of heart muscle cells, that is cardiac myocytes, they can communicate with each other across their cell membranes and groups of them will start coordinated contraction, even if they're not connected to the rest of the heart but they will do so at a relatively slow rate. If they receive more regular stimulation at a faster rate, they will contract as a result of that external stimulation. So what we find is that the heart muscle, the myocardium and the myocytes that make up that myocardium will contract at the rate of the fastest depolarizing tissue in the heart. And when an excitable cell depolarizes, that is the generation of a new electrical impulse. And when that electrical impulse goes to the muscle, it causes the muscle cell, in this case the cardiac myocyte, to depolarize. And when that depolarization occurs, that is the required impulse that stimulates the muscle to contract. So the muscle cell knows it's time to contract when it electrically depolarizes. And what we have in the right atrium, just near the entrance to the superior vena cava, is an area of specialised myocardial tissue. And this specialised myocardial tissue is designed to be electrically active rather than to be contractile, as the majority of the cardiac myocytes are designed to be contractile. And this area of tissue in the right atrium is called the pacemaker, or the sinoatrial node, because it generates the pace of the heart. It's called the sinoatrial node because it generates the sinus rhythm.
and the sinus rhythm is the electrical activity generated by normal myocardial depolarization resulting in myocardial contraction. And this specialized myocardial tissue comprising the sinoatrial node is described as being electrically unstable. It will spontaneously depolarize at a rate of about 90 to 100 beats per minute. And this is where the electrical activity for the contraction of the heart begins. It is intrinsic to the heart. The heart has its own pacemaker and does not require external neuronal electrical stimulation in order to contract. So every time the pacemaker spontaneously depolarizes, a new electrical impulse is generated. Now in a cardiac cycle, the first thing that you want to happen is that you want the atria to contract to propel the blood from the atria through to the ventricles, through the atrioventricular valves. So firstly, we need atrial myocardial contraction. And after the new electrical impulse is generated in the sinoatrial node, it will start traveling through to the atrial myocardium. Now, there are three preferential pathways which will conduct this electrical activity. These are called the posterior, the middle and the anterior pathways. And there is a branch from the anterior pathway goes across to the left atrium. And these areas, these preferential conducting areas, have myocardial cells which are designed specifically to conduct electrical activity and branches from them will go off into the atrial myocardium. And the speed at which these conducting pathways carry the new electrical impulse into the atrial myocardium is just right to cause coordinated atrial myocardial contraction. Therefore, we get exactly what we want at the start of a new cardiac cycle, atrial myocardial contraction. Now, the next thing we want to happen after the atria have contracted is that we want the ventricles to contract. But we want the ventricles to contract from the cardiac apex up the way so the blood is directed towards the arterial valves, that is, towards the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves so the blood can be ejected into the systemic circulation via the aorta and into the pulmonary circulation via the pulmonary artery. And one of the key things to grasp is the impulse that causes the ventricles to contract is the same impulse that causes the atria to contract. This is how the timing is coordinated. Now between the atria and the ventricles, of course, we have the valves, the atrioventricular valves. And in roughly the same plane, we've got these arterial valves. And the valves themselves are made of fibrous collagen-like material that doesn't conduct electricity. And surrounding those, there is more collagen fibrous type tissue. So what we actually have is a sheet or a plane of fibrous collagen type tissue dividing the atria from the ventricle components of the heart. And this is called the atrioventricular ring because it's between the atria and the ventricles. And this fibrous tissue does not conduct electricity. So the electrical impulse which caused the atria to contract will not transmit down into the ventricular areas of the heart directly. There is an insulating plane of tissue between the atria above and the ventricles below. With one exception. There is an area called the atrioventricular node which is between the atria and the ventricles. And this atrioventricular node, or the AV node, as it is often called, is electrically conducting. And in fact, this picks up the impulse from the atria and conducts it down towards the cardiac septum, down towards the ventricles. So the impulse is carried down from the atria towards the ventricles only through the atrioventricular node. And as the impulse goes through the atrioventricular node, it is slowed down slightly. There is a physiological delay of about 40 milliseconds. That's just under a 20th of a second. And this is important because after the atria contract, 
it's going to take just a little bit of time for the blood to move from the atria through the valves to the ventricles to fill up the ventricles prior to ventricular contraction, that is prior to ventricular systole. So there's this little bit of delay. And then connected to the underside of the atrioventricular node is the atrioventricular bundle. And this is a pathway of conducting tissue that transmits the impulse down the cardiac septum towards the apex of the ventricles from the atrioventricular node. And in the old days, this was called the bundle of Hiss or the atrioventricular bundle of Hiss. Now, of course, we have a left ventricle and we have a right ventricle. So this bundle of Hiss, this AV bundle, is relatively short and then it divides into two. And we have a left bundle branch and a right bundle branch. The left bundle branch is transmitting the electrical impulse, that is the wave of depolarization towards the left ventricle to stimulate left ventricular myocardial depolarization and therefore contraction. And the right bundle branch is taking the impulse towards the right ventricular myocardium. Now, both the right and the left bundle branch have subbranches that divide off to stimulate parts of the ventricular myocardium. But other components of the right and the left bundle branch go down pretty well towards the cardiac apex. And there they break up into lots of smaller conducting pathways called Purkinje fibers. And it's these Purkinje fibers that take the electrical activity into the myocardial muscle, cause that to depolarize and therefore cause ventricular contraction. And the electrical impulses from the right and the left bundle branch are precisely timed to go into the ventricular myocardium at just the right time to coordinate the waves of muscle contraction that are required to optimize the contraction of the ventricles and therefore the ejection of blood through the arterial valves into the aorta and into the pulmonary artery. And there are directional bands of myocardium that comprise the ventricular myocardium. And these cause the myocardium to contract in the way. Also, the septum will contract to pull it up the way. And also, the heart will twist a little bit as well. So the ventricles contract by squeezing in, pulling up and twisting sideways. This all optimizes the ejection of blood from the ventricles into the arterial system. And this is all coordinated and timed in a very precise way as the impulses go through the various parts of this internal electrical conducting system into the myocardium itself to stimulate the contractile cardiomyocytes. So we see that the heart has its own internal electrical conducting system. The impulse is generated brand new in the sinoatrial node, goes through these preferential conducting pathways called the internodal tracts. And it makes sense that they're called the internodal tracts because they're between the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node. From there, the impulse goes down the bundle of Hiss, down the atrioventricular bundle of Hiss, into the right and left bundle branches, perfusing out into the ventricular myocardium via these Purkinje fibers that transmit the impulse from the bundle branches directly into the myocardium, the internal electrical conducting system of the heart. Now, given that the sinoatrial node is depolarizing 90 to 100 times a minute, you might wonder why your heart rate when you're at rest is very often less than 90 to 100 beats per minute. In fact, if you're young and fit, your heart rate could be 60 or 50 or even potentially less. If you're athletically fit, your heart rate is going to be slower. So how is this facilitated? Well, you might remember that there's a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And the large parasympathetic nerve going down through the thoracic cavity is the vagus nerve. That is the 10th cranial nerve. And the vagus nerve is parasympathetic. So branches from the vagus nerve go into the sinoatrial node and into the atrioventricular node where they slow this heart rate down. 
So the intrinsic rate of depolarization determined by the instability of the sinoatrial node is actually moderated and slowed down by vagal impulses whenever your heart rate is less than the intrinsic rate of the sinoatrial node. And as we mentioned, this intrinsic rate is normally between 90 and 100 beats per minute. So if you're at rest now and your heart is 60 beats per minute, that is because your heart is being moderated by the parasympathetic activity from the vagus nerve. Now, conversely, if you have a fright or an emergency situation, that will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And again, nerve fibres from the sympathetic nervous system can innervate the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node and increase the rate of cardiac contraction. And sympathetic stimulation will increase heart rate but it will also increase the contractility of the myocardium, which will increase stroke volume. And both of these effects will increase cardiac output as a result of sympathetic stimulation. So we see that the heart has its own intrinsically generated rate of contraction, but this can be moderated on a second by second basis, depending on our current physiological requirements by innovation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And the heart rate can also be affected by hormonal chemical influences as well. For example, you might think of adrenaline, which of course will increase the heart rate. And the heart rate can also be affected by hormones such as thyroxine. So this means that the heart will work hard enough to meet our physiological requirements. But then when it doesn't have to be working hard, it will slow down under this parasympathetic influence and just keep enough cardiac output to maintain the physiological requirements of the moment.